we come now to Psalm 100. And out of all the 150 psalms, this is the only psalm that bears the title, a psalm of thanksgiving. And that's what the title is in the Hebrew text. You can see it there in our English Bibles. It's the portion that comes before verse 1. And again, for Psalm 100, it simply says, a psalm of thanksgiving. It speaks of an invitation to the whole world to give thanks and to know and to worship God. I like what G. Campbell Morgan said about Psalm 100. He said, It is jubilant with its confidence for the whole earth as it contemplates the glory of that earth when all its people are submitted to the reign of Jehovah. Indeed, it is a fantastic, beautiful psalm. Though it is short, only five verses, Let's take a look at it together, beginning with the first two verses of Psalm 100. Make a joyful shout to the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Now, unlike the several previous psalms, Psalm 100 does not begin with a declaration of God's sovereignty or his character. A common beginning in the previous several psalms would be something like, The Lord reigns, or something similar to that. No, here in Psalm 100, it begins with this call out to the world to say, Make a joyful shout to the Lord. It's a simple and a direct encouragement to all you lands to praise God with a joyful heart. It's a call to the nations far beyond Israel's borders. Again, make a joyful shout to the Lord, all you lands. So the fact that it's to extend out to all peoples is significant, but also is significant there in the first line, the simple phrase, make a joyful shout. The sense behind the Hebrew original for a joyful shout seems to be the kind of happy shout that loyal subjects give when their king or queen appears in their midst. I like what Charles Spurgeon had to say about this. He said, Our happy God should be worshipped by a happy people. A cheerful spirit is in keeping with his nature, his acts, and the gratitude which we should cherish for his mercies. And again, this idea of a joyful noise, the idea is simply of this shout of acclamation, a shout of honor and glory to a king. That's the kind of joyful shout that we should give. And then secondly, it says there in verse 2, serve the Lord with gladness. Now, the whole earth is invited not only to make a joyful shout to God, but also to serve the Lord. The psalmist here likely had in mind the service of worship, the service of temple rituals. But the principle applies to any service that's directed to God. Those who serve the Lord should do it with what? It says there in verse 2, serve the Lord with gladness. Brothers and sisters, I don't know in what way God has given you to serve him. I believe that it is the call and the responsibility of every believer in Jesus Christ to have some purposeful, intentional way that they serve the Lord and seek to further his kingdom. Maybe it's serving the Lord in your church. You're a children's ministry worker. You lead an adult education class. You help in the parking lot with parking the cars. You help to set up chairs or to prepare things. You're on the worship team. And it may be some service within the church. But you can also serve the Lord and extend his kingdom by serving in your community. Well, there's the rescue mission and you help with their meals or you help with what they do. There's some evangelistic team going out to the streets and you're helping with them. There are ways within our congregation and in our community that we can and we should be serving the Lord. But don't miss the point here in verse two. If you're going to serve the Lord, do it with gladness. Do it with a happy heart. Again, let me read to you what Adam Clark said about this idea, serve the Lord with gladness. Quote, he said, 
it is your privilege and duty to be happy in your religious worship. The religion of the true God is intended to remove human misery and to make mankind happy. He whom the religion of Christ has not made happy does not understand that religion or does not make a proper use of it. Well, I think that's true. It's, we're not trying to say that every day is fun, that every experience of worshiping God is filled with excitements and fun and all that. No, no, we're talking about true gladness, a happy heart before God. So again, let's look at these three lines in verses one and two. Make a joyful shout to the Lord, all you lands. That's the first thing. The second thing is serve the Lord with gladness, but don't miss the third thing. It's the second line of verse two. Come before his presence with singing. Now, as in many places in the Psalms, praise unto God is expressed in song. Singing is not the only way to praise God, but I don't think I'm being too extreme when I say it is in the scriptures the chief way to praise him. Yes, we want to praise God with our words. We want to praise God with our obedience. We want to praise God with our prayers. We want to praise God when we read his word. We want to praise God in doing good, both in our churches and in our communities. Yes, all those are ways that we actively praise God. But don't neglect the most frequently spoken form of praise in the scriptures, and that's to praise him in singing. God loves to hear us sing. And if we're going to come before his presence... We should do it with singing. Now, maybe you don't feel like you have such a great singing voice. Lots of us don't. I don't particularly feel that I have a great singing voice at all. But I love to sing unto the Lord. Do you? You need to have a heart that would just simply says, Lord, I know that you love to hear me sing. So I want to sing unto you. I want to praise you in song. So come before his presence with singing. Serve the Lord with gladness. Put away that mopey, discouraged, miserable way of serving God. Serve him with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. And then now in verse 3, he's going to explain to us why we should do this. Notice this, verse 3. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Now notice this. Verse 3 begins with the simple statement, Know that the Lord, he is God. The praise that comes to God from his people, and indeed, if you go back to verse 1, from all lands, should be mindful. And we have many reasons to worship Yahweh, the covenant God of Israel, the Lord, as you see it expressed there in your Bible translations, Lord written in all capital letters. We have many reasons to praise the Lord, but the reasons begin with the recognition that he is God. Again, know that the Lord, he is God. You know, this is an especially needful world for the nations, the nations that surrounded Israel in its day. uh, I'm talking about in Bible times and for the world to hear today, because there are many pretended and supposed gods in this world. Now, in Bible times, there was Baal, there was Dagon, there was Asherah, there was Molech. There was more gods than you can count on two hands or count on all your hands and all your feet. No, there were many, many gods in the ancient world, but only one God was true. That's why he proclaims here in verse 3, Know that the Lord, he is God. He's God. How about this? He's God and you're not. That's the most elementary lesson of theology, isn't it? That there is a God who reigns in heaven, who is the creator of all things, and we are not that God. We recognize that the intelligent understanding that Yahweh is God gives us a firm foundation for our worship. It's something that we know. It's intelligent. Our our worship has a, a, 
a great uh, emotional sense with it, but it is firmly founded on knowledge, knowledge that the Lord, he is God. And so it's as if he's calling out to all the heathen nations of distant lands. And he says, you, you forged false gods in all your imaginations. No, now you need to come and know that the Lord, he is God. The next line in verse three, it is he who has made us. The next reason to worship God is in appropriate recognition of his work as creator. The idea that we could make ourselves is crazy. And we should worship the one who has made us. God has a right to us and a right to our worship because he's made us. So number one, know that the Lord, he is God. That's a reason to worship him. But then secondly, know that it is he who has made us. Now, I want you to think carefully about that, how important it is for us to begin with the thought that God is our creator and we are his creatures. I like what James Montgomery Boyce had to say about this. He said, of course, if we do not need God as our creator, then we do not need to be thankful. Why should we? We got here by ourselves, thank you. We have no one but ourselves to thank. Again, that's James Montgomery Boyce. Now, there are people in the world who think that they have made themselves. <laughs> they might even call themselves self-made men. Listen, the self-made man loves to worship his own supposed creator. In other words, he worships himself. No, but friends, on this point, I'm going to agree with that man, Charles Spurgeon, that great preacher of Victorian England. He said this, for our part, we find it far more easy to believe that the Lord made us than that we were developed by a long chain of natural selections from floating atoms which fashion themselves. Amen to that. It's a lot more reasonable to believe that there is a creator God rather than things created themselves. So we have wonderful reasons to praise God, that he is God that he is made us. Now, by the way, can I add this? That under the new covenant, the believer has a second reason. I might even say a greater reason to praise God. That he or she is a new creation in Jesus Christ. If you're born again by God's spirit, you've been twice created. You were created according to the flesh by God who made you in his image but then you were created again by the work of being born again and being made a new creation in Christ Jesus. That's in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. So now, verse 3 also gives us a third reason to worship God. First, because he's God. Secondly, because he's made us. Third, because we are his people and the sheep of his pasture. This third reason to worship God is because he has chosen a people. Now, we would say originally the Jewish people as his covenant people, the covenant he made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and then added among his people, the followers of Jesus Christ, that we are his people and he cares for us as the sheep of his pasture. Dear brother or sister, do you know that shepherdly care of God in your life? That you know how to respond to him when he leads you to green pastures. You know how to take a drink when he leads you beside still waters. That you know how to receive the shepherdly care that God would give to you. If you are one of his people, if you are one of the sheep of his pasture, then receive his shepherdly care. That's God's blessing for us. That's God's challenge to us. He says to his people, don't be disobedient sheep. Don't be stubborn sheep. Don't be dumb sheep, so to speak, but come and receive my shepherdly care. We love that phrase, 
We are his people. We are the sheep of his pasture. What a beautiful, powerful thing. But then it gives us just a little bit of pause. And it says, Lord, I want to receive all the shepherdly care that you have to give unto me. Now, the theme of thanksgiving is going to continue on. We were given three reasons for thanks and praise to God in verse 3. Now, the idea continues into verse 4 about how we should give thanks. This is what we should do when we give thanks. Check this out, verse 4. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name. You see, now the psalmist pictures the people of God from all you lands. Way, that's way back in verse 1. Now they are entering through the gates and into the courts of the temple. D- did you see that there in verse 4? Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. You see, as God's people approach, they should approach with thanksgiving, recognizing how much God has done for us. We can't exhaust that, can we? We can talk all day long, every day, about the marvelous things that God has done for us. Therefore, it's very appropriate for us to enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Now, I want to make something clear here. The scene of verse 4, enter into his gates and into his courts, is of public worship. Worship together with God's people. Now, there may be rare and temporary occasions when we are prevented from the public community worship with God's people, when we are prevented from coming together with the people of God and worshiping him in song, worshiping him by receiving his word, worshiping him in prayer, worshiping him by the care we give to one another. There may be times and seasons where we are prevented from such coming together, but they should only be temporary. No, The norm for Christians is that we come together into his gates with thanksgiving. We come together into his courts with praise. The vision given to us in verse 4 is not some kind of solo, lone ranger Christianity. No, but it's simply the idea that we need to be together with God's people when we do it. As it says here, it I'm going to read to you from James Montgomery Boyce. He said this, It teaches that there is a special aspect of thanksgiving that involves the whole people of God together and not just the private prayers of individuals. Now, is it good for you to give thanks to God in your private prayers? Absolutely it is. Is it good for you to praise him in your private prayers? I hope that you do, and I hope that you do it more and more. But don't think that that ends it. No, we need to do it together with God's people. When we enter his courts, we need to be grateful just for the opportunity to gather together with the people of God. We need to do what it says there in verse 4. The last line, we need to come into his courts with praise. Now we have thanks and praise. It's as if they're merging together as God's people are thankful and as they bless his name. I like what G. Camel Morgan said about this. He said, it is as though the gates of the city, the courts of the sanctuary were suddenly thrown open and all lands are called to serve Jehovah, to know that he is God and to enter into relationship with him. Again, that's G. Camel Morgan. Now, This is what's beautiful for us. We are invited to bring our thanks and our praise into the very courts of God. It's as if the gates have been thrown open. The courts are opened wide. But under the new covenant, not only are the gates and the courts open, but even the way to the holy of holies is thrown 
open for the believer in Jesus Christ. That's what we read in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19, that we have been given a new and living way to the holiest of holies so that we can come and bring him the thanksgiving and the praise that he deserves. Now, verse 5, the psalm concludes with sort of giving an explanation of why. Why should we give such praise to God when we come into his courts? Why should we give such thanksgiving unto him when the gates are opened for us to do it? Why? Look at verse 5. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endures to all generations. Make no mistake about it. Verse 5. The Lord is good. Thanks and praise are right in recognition of God's goodness. God is good in his plans. He's good in his grace. He's good in his forgiveness. He's good in his covenant. And he's good in every aspect of his being. You can count on it, as it says in verse 5, for the Lord is good good. Now, I want you to consider something. Before, I spoke about the gods of the pagans, Baal, Ashereth, Dagon, Molech. Let me tell you something about those gods of the pagan nations that surrounded Israel. They were not good. They were often selfish. They often did things for no reason. You could never know for sure if you were right with those gods or not. And they were often out to do you harm. That's not so with our God. No, the God that is revealed to us in the Bible is a God who is good. God is good all the time. And all the time, God is good. So much so that we can confidently say what it reveals to us here in verse 5. His mercy is everlasting. You see, this brief psalm ends with God's unending mercy and truth. They are everlasting. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endures to all generations. Now, do you receive something from the mercy of God? Do you benefit something from the truth of God? (laughs) Then you have, I believe, a holy obligation to, in an everlasting way, praise him and give him thanks. That's what God deserves from those who have received such mercy and who has received such truth from him. Let me conclude this section of our study on Psalm 100 by examining something that George Horn, the old Anglican bishop, wrote. He said this, How glorious will be that day which shall behold the everlasting gates of heaven lifting up their heads and disclosing to view those courts above into which the children of the resurrection are to enter there with the angels and archangels to dwell and sing forevermore. Oh, that'll be a glorious day. Not just for those who are believers now, but for those from every tribe and tongue and people that God will bring to faith in Messiah Jesus, our Savior, our Lord. Now, before we leave Psalm 100, let's just think for a moment, how does Psalm 100 point to Jesus Christ? Let me suggest three ways. Maybe if we took more time, we could come up with more than three ways, but I'm going to suggest to you three ways that Psalm 100 points to Jesus. Number one, Jesus calls out to all the lands of the earth. Verse one says, make a joyful shout to the Lord, all you lands. And we see the psalmist in Psalm 100 calling out to all the lands of the world. Well, Jesus does the same. You see, this heart for all the lands of the earth is reflected in the great commission that Jesus gave to his people in Matthew chapter 28, telling us to make disciples of all nations. That's what he's given us to do. Secondly, we can say this. 
Jesus sang before the Lord. Now, in verse 2, did you see what it said? It said, come before his presence with singing. Now, certainly that's true for the people of God, but have you ever thought that Jesus himself sang praises to his God and Father? Matthew chapter 26, verse 30, and Mark chapter 14, verse 26, specifically tell us that Jesus sang hymns with his disciples. And that was surely only one of many times that Jesus sang. So we see, first of all, Jesus has a heart for the ends of the earth. Secondly, Jesus sang before the Lord. And now thirdly, Jesus is the ultimate shepherd. Verse 3 says, We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Jesus is the good shepherd. That's in John 10. And he's the great shepherd. That's in Hebrews chapter 13. He's the chief shepherd. That's in 1 Peter chapter 5. He will be our shepherd for all eternity, according to Revelation chapter 7. Truly, we are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for being our great shepherd. Let's pray in conclusion and in recognition of these wonderful truths of Psalm 100. Lord, we want to add our joyful shout of praise and thanksgiving to that which has been offered to you by your people throughout so many generations. We again, we say, thank you, Lord. We praise you, Lord. We give you a joyful shout of praise, and we can't stop thanking you for all you have given us in the person and work of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord God. Thank you that you have sent Jesus to be our great shepherd, our good shepherd, our chief shepherd. And we receive his shepherdly care as being the sheep of his pasture. And we do it, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.